I like to call this meeting to order. It is a very great pleasure to come out of hiding and uh, be here to welcome and introduce my old friend and colleague, Professor Jonathan Silk, tonight. Jonathan was um, trained at the University of Michigan under the late great Luis Gomez. Um, uh, so that's where he took his PhD and he wrote at that time on the Maharatnakuta collection and especially the Maharashi. And um, after that he went on to hold teaching positions at Grinnell College, the uh, University of Western Michigan, Yale, UCLA, and then finally at the University of Leiden, where he has been since 2007. University of Leiden, as most of you will know, is, a, is one of the powerhouses of Asian studies in Europe and has been for, for well, since the last century. And it's associated with great names in our field, like Andrew Kern and Eric and many others. Dr. Silk is the author of many books and articles on a wide range of topics, including the Heart Sutra in Tibetan, Body Language, which, was, which is a, um, a work on relics and their worship, Managing Monks, which deals with monastic roles in, in administration, Riven by Lust, which, in which he turns his attention to incest, and Schism in Buddhist Sangha. Uh, we also have Buddhist Cosmic Unity, which is a translation and study of the Anuna Atva Apurnatva Niradesha materials towards the study of Vasubandhu's Vimshika. And then more recently, uh, with Michael Radich, he uh, edited um, the fantastic work um, left behind by our late lamented colleague Stefano Zacchetti on the Daja Dulun. And in fact, he's edited a number of volumes in addition to the ones he's authored. Um, going back further, we have the first trip for Nagal Gajin. And, um, and with Luis Gomez, even more years ago, studies in the literature of the great vehicle. And many more to come, we hope, including the eagerly awaited translation and study of the Kasha for Parvata. Uh, Jonathan is the founding editor-in-chief of um, Brill's Encyclopedia of Buddhism, which many of you will know, already two very hefty volumes, more on the way. So this is a real labor of Hercules to be superintending such a thing, or labor of Sisyphus, if you like, because it involves a lot of pushing and pulling, <laughs> not always successfully. Um, He's also the co-editor-in-chief of the Indo-Iranian Journal and the director of the Open Philology Project of Leiden University. So he is a person renowned uh, in the Buddhist studies field for his uh, prodigious learning, for a bibli bibliographical knowledge which is second to none, and for his um, uncontrollable love of atrocious puns. <laughs> in which matter he outdoes even me, because I like them too. <laughs> so uh, I hope all those things will be on display tonight, maybe not the puns, but the rest. And uh, I invite him now to talk on the topic, a window into Sino-Tibetan Pure Land Practices at Dunhuang. Jonathan, welcome to Stanford again. Thank you. Uh, in the very first place, of course, my, uh, it's my great pleasure to acknowledge with gratitude the invitation uh, from the center and uh, from my uh, friend Paul. We were trying the other day to figure out when we had uh, first met, but certainly it was uh, a great many years ago. And, um, and it's, uh, it's always, uh, perhaps as one gets older, it becomes more of a pleasure to, to meet old friends. Um, if I had really prodigious learning, I would be able to quote Confucius uh, on this point, but I can't. Um, in any event, it's really uh, great to be here, uh, back indeed, back at Stanford. I can't remember the last time I was here, but uh, it's always a pleasure. And um, I don't know what to do with the introduction because it sets a rather high bar. <laughs> I'm afraid you may be disappointed. <laughs> in any event, what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes today with you is, um, yeah, described in the title, um, uh, a sort of small 
uh, um, glimpse at um, some somewhat speculative uh, suggestions about what may have been going on in a period of a couple centuries in, uh, in Dunhuang. So if you look at this, if, if it's not washed out, um, uh, I'm, I'm sure I don't need to explain the importance of the site of Dunhuang, but what we see in this map, I think interestingly, is the extent of the military control, the greatest extent of the military control of the Tibetan Empire in the, let's say it roughly, um, plus or minus 800, something like that. Um, of course, something to be said about all such maps and uh, um, probably those of us who teach surveys are used to saying it about Ashoka, for example, is that we have, uh, many people I think have a notion of, um, of military control of a territory being a kind of overarching notion in the same way that, you know, if the American military controls uh, the borders of the United States, they pretty much control all of it. Well, in the pre-modern world, that was not the case, of course. And so when we look at this picture, we shouldn't think that the Tibetan military was in control of this entire area, and we shouldn't think that Tibetan culture and language was pervasive through these areas. It's a much different kind of situation. So it's a sort of caveat how to think about this. Um, among other things, the population density in the Tibetan plateau has never been uh, great at all. and so. Most of the area, which is uh, sort of grayed here, um, would have just been entirely unpopulated. So it's a little bit slightly misleading, but it gives you, um, I think, uh, uh, some kind of idea. And it's particularly interesting in that um, I think there's a tendency when one reads and thinks about Dunhuang as being um, sort of the, the terminus of the Silk Roads, as it's sometimes described. So you have the, the, um, to the west, the, the deserts and the, and the roots, and to the right, China. But when you look at this, you see that the, whatever, in whatever sense this made sense to say uh, that there was m Chinese and uh, Tibetan military control, Dunhuang was not at all on the edge. It really was quite substantially um, uh, distant from the, the edges of the region of exercise of control. Um, that's not 100% germane to what I'm talking about, but I want to emphasize that because I think it's important for understanding that we're talking about a territory which at least at a certain point in time was situated within a Tibetan realm. And I'll come back to that. Um, so Tibet proper um, uh, in this period was of course centered, maybe I should have gone back and said, um, centered in the region uh, that's now, so Lhasa as such didn't really exist then, but the Yarlung Valley and this region here. And that's the, that was and continues to be the, I'm not sure now we, one can even talk about a political center of Tibet, but um, unless one's talking about Dharamsala, but in any event, um, uh, historically that's the, the cultural center of, of the Tibetan region. And um, that's widely regarded as the, the sort of birthplace of Tibetan Buddhism. And as you know, um, uh, the Tibetan narratives themselves have a story about how the Tibetans adopted Indian Buddhism after having um, uh, sponsored a debate, as it's often termed, between um, Chinese uh, Chan advocates and Kamala Shila, et cetera, et cetera. Well, part of what I'm going to talk about is um, uh, the, the misleading nature of that. Because, of course, um, especially in the region to the east, Dunhuang, we have uh, ample evidence for uh, Chinese-influenced or Sinitic uh, uh, culture, particularly Buddhist culture, at the same time. And if you just simply look at a map and you think, well, where, what were the formative influences on Tibetan culture? It's very obvious that they come both from the south, from, let's call it Sanskritic India, and from the east, from uh, China and Sinitic um, culture. Now, 
we come to pure land. So um, I, I um, sort of fell into this uh, research by noticing the existence of, of certain um, uh, manuscript documents and being curious about them and um, just working on them because I didn't know what they were. And so um, uh, I would go further and say that, in fact, um, probably almost all of the motivation for my scholarship is simply confusion and ignorance. And I notice things and I don't understand them and I think, okay, well, I have to learn more. So um, especially to the students, I would say um, these are strengths, not weaknesses. When you don't understand something, this is a good thing. So, um, uh, and I was also having been uh, trained, Paul uh, skipped that part of the, of the historical narrative, but um, I, uh, I had uh, formative training in Japan where there's a, a sort of largely unquestioned narrative about Pure Land traditions. And I tried to understand um, what the relationship between these, um, let's, for the lack of a better word, call them medieval Tibetan documents coming from Dunhuang were and um, other Pure Land traditions. And um, uh, that's sort of, um, self-questioning has continued as I've tried to understand the nature of some of the documents I'm going to introduce today as well as others in a Tibetan sphere. Um, and if you'll excuse me, it's really warm so I'm going to take this off. I hope you don't uh, mind. Um, I'll come back later and talk about just what it might mean to talk about Pure Land um, in uh, Tibetan context, and um, I've used the scare quotes for a reason, but we'll come back to that. But let's just naively assume that we can talk about this uh, notion, and we can recognize that sources, textual sources, for pure land in a Tibetan sphere include the Indian uh, scriptures. So, and in my opinion, not everybody agrees with this, but in my opinion that means basically the larger and so-called larger and smaller Sukhavati view hot sutras. Um, some other people, and I don't know Paul Harrison's opinion, but some other people think that the Pratyutpanna, Samukhavastita, and uh, the Akshobhya Tathagata Vyuha and other texts like this are also pure land texts. I don't think so, but we can have a discussion about that or we can leave it. Um, and there are also Chinese texts, including the so-called Contemplation Sutra or the Meditation Sutra, which, to the best of my knowledge, was never translated into Tibetan, but certainly there is evidence that it was known. And finally, I would say that there are Tibetan innovations that can be associated with this tradition. And um, as we go along, I will come back to this. Um, now, what kind of evidence for these general questions can we get from Dunhuang in a in a, with a focus on pure land, and we can reduce it sort of to two, which is sutra translations from Chinese and Tibetan compositions which were created in, let's say, minimally a bilingual or maybe we should even say multilingual environment. And in terms of pure land traditions, these are largely but not entirely limited to hymns of praise. This is, um, there's some, uh, denominational problem with this term, but for lack of a better term, let's just say hymns. Now, um, these hymns uh, that, that have been identified have uh, all been published by me. Um, and that includes, uh, yeah, these are also my translations of the titles. And um, as I say that, I'm kicking myself, let me say, of what I thought we could identify as a title because often either the manuscripts in which these materials are contained don't contain titles or they contain multiple titles and you got to call it something unless you're just going to number them. So um, uh, yeah, so um, I've published these and if you're interested as of course I know you are, um, you can easily read them. Um, I'll just throw in a little pitch that
All of these publications are available uh, on the website of my project, openphilology.eu, um, completely free of charge, <laughs> and on my academia page, and probably you could pay for them on Scribe if you wanted to, I guess. Um, and there's also a, a short text which I published, um, which we don't have time to talk to, but it's super interesting. And uh, it's, it has a title, The Ten Virtues of Loudly Uttering the Expression Amita Buddha. And just as a footnote, um, this is a translation from Chinese. Um, so not a Tibetan composition. Um, and it's, it was really cool, I thought. So when I read the text, uh, the first time I read it, in 1994, I didn't really understand it, and I didn't have access to photographs, only a transcript, which was not very good. And I didn't really know what was going on. And some years later, when I looked at it again, I thought, wait a minute, something's different. And long story short, I figured out that it was a translation from Chinese. And it's, it comes from a passage in a commentary on the smaller Sukhavati Vyuha. And it's very interesting in that sense because it's talking about the Nienfo or Japanese Nembutsu, the recitation of the name. But it makes the point that you should do this loudly, not sort of muttering um, under your breath or something. And then the text, in fact, gives 10 reasons why. So, for example, that it frightens Mara to hear this recitation. It's a very cool, interesting text. Anyway, these texts belong to, ex with the exception of the last one, belong to um, a category which um, I think without doubt are original Tibetan compositions but created in this quite Sinitic environment. At the same time, the, the environment itself has plenty of examples of texts which are demonstrably translations from Chinese into Tibetan. And some of these, a great many of these, made their way into the kanjurs, into the canonical Tibetan collections, but not all of them. So I published a list which is incomplete. Um, I mean, it wasn't intended to be incomplete. Rather, I identified further members of the list after I published it, of um, a list of, and where did I publish that? I don't remember. Um, OK. Mm. In the um, Aririab, the uh, Journal of the Soka University something, something. Um, <laughs> I don't remember what it's called, actually. Um, uh, um, uh, what I put up here is only the texts which are plausibly um, associated with the, um, I don't know how to say this. I'm tempted to say bicultural, bilingual translator, but um, it's not even really true to say that. It's more um, like the, the joke if you say, okay, this individual, Chodrup Fachang, is he Chinese? Is he Tibetan? And the answer is yes. So he's, he's not bicultural so much as this is his nature. He belongs to this complete mix. Um, it's a different question, I think, to what extent we can say he as an individual person is responsible for these translations or how much there was a team and so forth, and we don't know. Just as another footnote, um, a scholar named uh, Li Channa, who is now in Vienna, has worked on this figure. And um, sometimes I think that when we, we speak of these figures who are responsible for this and responsible for that, they they sort of fade away as individuals. But she, at least, believes that she can recognize his handwriting. So um, if she's correct, then we really have uh, an anchor for identifying the actual work of a real human being. And that's, I think, quite exciting. So any, in any event, um, we have uh, um, a number of texts which are um, uh, plausibly uh, uh, associated with him. Um, including such important texts as the Suvarna Bahasa and Lankavatara, um, the Yulan Banjing, etc. I'm not going to go into the details of this. Um, certainly, a study of these texts as a group would be 
incredibly interesting. One plausible hypothesis, I believe, is that certain texts were available to Buddhist communities in Dunhuang translated from Sanskrit. At the same time, the community became aware of other texts which they did not have access to in Tibetan, and nor did they have Sanskrit manuscripts, and they may well have said, well, let's translate them from Chinese. I'll come back to this notion in a minute. Um, there are also texts, and this is transitioning into our main topic, which exist both in the Kanjur, so there is a kind of canonized translation, plausibly from Sanskrit, and simultaneously we find at Dunhuang only evidence for other translations made from Chinese. And so I, um, I finished this, I don't know how long ago, but it's still not published, an edition of this uh, fascinating text called the Gangotara Paripracha. Um, and uh, Li Chana, whom I mentioned a moment ago, has been working on the Maitreya Paripracha. And uh, both these, for reasons that we are not sure about, are found together in one manuscript, um, uh, which is preserved in Paris. Um, in any event, there are texts which, for which we have multiple versions um, in Tibetan. Um, okay. Now, we finally reach that topic. Among the examples of texts for which we have in the canonical collections translations from Sanskrit and at Dunhuang translations from Chinese are the so-called smaller and larger Sukhavati Vyuha. Um, uh, the importance of which I think I don't need to probably to explain to you. So, um, smaller Sukhavati Vyuha, the Amitwajing, Amidakyo in Japanese, um, uh, we have in a scroll um, of which we have only two-thirds of it extant, um, known, I would say. Um, it's possible that the other third of the scroll is somewhere, but if so, I have no way to find it. And I've looked for it, but I haven't found it. It's quite plausible that um, the scroll was torn in antiquity, and there was never the, the, the missing third was never in the cave. I don't know. And um, uh, I've seen the scroll in Paris, but the way it was preserved, it was put into this kind of gauze that's glued onto the manuscript. So there's no way to see the tear. So, not that I know what I'm looking at, but at least I would have liked to look at it and see whether the tear looked really old, but okay. Not that, as I say, I don't know why I would have known. But anyway, you can't do that because of the way that manuscript has been preserved. Um, and I'll come back in a, in a moment to what is sitting there on the bottom, transcription. I'll come back to that. Um, there is an a extremely interesting manuscript of which this is a close-up. Um, and that is preserved as Paleo Tibetan 1257. And this is a combination sort of table of contents or listing of titles and glossary, bilingual, Tibetan Chinese. And a, quite a number of the text titles are texts which we now know to have been translated from Chinese into Tibetan, most likely at Dunhuang. Um, this is a, um, a super interesting document for all kinds of material reasons, namely exactly Julia's turning her head, right? So the Tibetan is written one way and the Chinese is written another way. Um, and then for the glossary portion, um, they are written in the same direction, but you can see, or and you can see, for example, here, that the Tibetan must have been written first and the Chinese filled in later. Um, and uh, this has been studied by James Apple and I don't, frankly, don't remember whether he asked the question um, which has been asked and answered about the Mahavyutpati. Namely, the Mahavyutpati is not so much designed from the beginning as a glossary, as a sort of glossorial um, extract from, from texts. 
And so you can identify sections of the Mahavyutpati, the, the uh, Sanskrit Tibetan um, glossary, by, and, and show which texts they extracted vocabulary from. And I honestly don't remember whether that has been done for this manuscript. In any event, the point of, of introducing this manuscript here is that um, this demonstrates that there was a self-conscious uh, project of this bilingual Tibetan uh, Chinese working in Buddhist Dunhuang. This is a photograph of, um, and it's, it's a single scroll, but it doesn't fit in one slide. So <laughs> um, this is a photograph of uh, the translation of the uh, two-thirds remaining of the portion of the uh, smaller scrub di Vyuha. And this is Tibetan, and I'll, at the end of, later in the talk, I'll come back to this. However, it's not the only evidence that we have from Dunhuang, because we also have a manuscript of which this is a portion. And you can see that it was copied onto something that had been used for something else, because the Buddhas are upside down. And if you read Tibetan, you can take a look at this and you can see what's going on. Namely, this is Tibetan script, but this is not Tibetan. What is it? This is Chinese, written in Tibetan script. Fine, no problem, right? Why would there be a problem? It's exactly the same way that we can write Arabic in, in Roman letters. No problem. So, why would one do this? There are two, I think, oh, let's say minimally two plausible um, answers to this question. And one which I find, let's say, less exciting is the idea, and this, sorry, this, um, let's say, genre of Chinese texts written in Tibetan script, phonetically, essentially, um, there are a number of examples of this. And they have been gathered and studied by, oh, it's very small there, but anyway, Takata Tokyo, who is an expert in Chinese historical phonology. And these documents, to the best of my knowledge, have been studied so far almost only by specialists in Chinese historical phonology. You can understand why they would be fascinated. It's like here, like, how did we pronounce this word? Well, it's written down in another script. Um, so, uh, one of the suggestions that Takata has made, which in its own right is extremely fascinating, is that there were periods when monastic ordination required recitation of texts. And for individuals who could not read Chinese, who were not literate in written Chinese, this could, and, but were literate, could read written Tibetan, this would provide a way, a sort of aid memoir or something, to um, memorize texts which could have been required for uh, the examinations, you could call them. Now, this is plausible, and um, Professor Kishnik can comment on it later, perhaps. But I think what's more exciting, and to me uh, even more likely, is that these were intended for recitation of the text by persons who were, let's say, primarily literate in Tibetan, but whose Buddhism was Chinese. And I'm using Chinese in a, in a kind of vague cloud sense here. And I would ask us to think, for example, as an analogy to the way that you have American Buddhist communities, Zen communities, for example, who sit with a book in which you have chanting written out in Roman script. In, in, in fact, in America, it's even more bizarre, right? Because you have um, romanization in Japanese pronunciation of Chinese. So even if you know Japanese, it's no help at all, <laughs> but okay. 
and you chant the text. Now, why do I think this is a more compelling, this, I want to emphasize that this is speculative, it's all speculative, but why do I think this is um, a slightly more compelling? It's not either or, of course, it could be both, but, um, and that's because of the existence of what I pointed out to you a moment ago, which is the translation of the text from Chinese into Tibetan. Why? I think, imagination, that you may have had a community which was chanting the text, and at some point somebody said, um, <clears throat> by the way, what does it say? <laughs> I'm really actually curious about the content. Okay, we can translate the text as well. The, te the actual text you're chanting, not the other version of the text, which may or may not have been available at Dunhuang at that time. So, I think that um, uh, this is one aspect of the possible um, actual practice, and I'll come back later to the question about to what extent, if at all, we can call this pure land practice, but that this was something which could plausibly have been taking place at Dunhuang. Now, Alongside the smaller sutra, we also have the so-called larger Sukhavati Vyuha, of which we have a number of translations um, with uh, contested <laughs> translatorship. Fortunately for us, that's not relevant here. Um, some of these, for some of these, we do have evidence of the text also physically being present in Dunhuang. Um, and uh, one particular version, of course, uh, there are many uh, manuscripts. Now, for one of the uh, translations that produced or attributed to, let's say, Bodhiruchi in, uh, in the mid Tang period, um, so um, the date uh, 713 is the, is the date um, at which the collection in which this is collected, um, the Dabao Jijing, the Maharatna Kuta collection, was presented to the throne. So it doesn't tell you exactly, and even if it were meaningful to say, the date at which the translation were completed. But anyway, it's a, it's a point in time. And we do have evidence of this text having been present in Chinese at Dunhuang, but what we also have, and this is, I think, extremely interesting, and this is what we're going to spend much of the rest of the time talking about, is we have a number of manuscripts, the, the serial numbers of which I've listed there, which contain a Tibetan translation of this Chinese version. Um, about something more than half the text is preserved. Now, What's interesting when we look at this? When you simply look at the material evidence, and also, by the way, I haven't seen these, I've seen only photographs. So I, I'm not in a position to comment about paper or feel or something like that. Um, but simply um, information which you can gather from catalog entries and photographs, um, that the, e each individual manuscript is of widely differing size, very different size, and very different um, writing um, sort of geometry on the page. However, when we look at the content of the text, what do we see? When you line up the manuscripts and you line up the correspondence to the source from which we know the text was translated, we know it was translated from Chinese, so we can track it. What do we see? <coughs> it maps precisely. There are no gaps. Let's look at the manuscripts. So this is where it begins, and I put the dimensions there, 13 by 59. Very nicely written, really crisp, Sequentially, you get this, different dimensions, a bit of a mess, 
or a lot of a mess. Different dimensions again. Now you have, um, it's not rubrication. I think it was an attempt to write lines, which the scribe then wasn't very good at following. Another one, again, different dimensions. Sort of all over the place, can't even keep the lines in the same dimension. Another, here you see really lost control, copying. Other dimensions still. This is enormous, right? 79 centimeters, that's big. And you can see by looking at certain places that um, this was not done by a professional scribe, let's say. <laughs> Here you can see that even when there are lines, the scribe was unable to, to follow along. Things are evidently forgotten, added in. Now, okay, maybe I'll just talk about this now. What do I think the explanation for this is? I think, and again, it's speculation, but I think this is evidence of communal scripture copying. I think it's very clear that this is not the, the, what came from the translator's pen or brush or whatever it was. They had a manuscript which then they copied, I believe. Some community, I believe, you can imagine a scenario where they said, let's copy the text. Bring your paper, bring your pen, we'll come together. And people brought what paper they had. Some people had small paper, some people had big paper. Some people could write well, some people couldn't write well. And they copied and then somebody said, I copied up to here, you start at this point. And in fact, we find that the next page, completely different handwriting, completely different paper size, but it begins exactly where the other one leaves off. So I think when you talk about, when I talk about this window into Pure Land practice, I think this is evidence of a communal copying practice. It's speculative. I can't prove it, but I think it's extremely suggestive. i just give you a couple of examples of interesting things about the content of the text. We could probably be here all week if we wanted to actually sit down and read the text. But um, as you know, if you've ever looked at, for example, the smaller Sukhavti view, Hada Amitwa Jing, there is seemingly endless exegesis about the minutia of the meaning, the theological meaning of the text interpreted by different scholars. And one of the things that's fascinating about looking at this Tibetan translation is that this provides us, okay, so maybe I should, maybe I should back up and, and say something else. We do have commentaries on the text, of course. And those commentaries give us a self-conscious, a picture of a self-conscious interpretation of the text. A commentator tells you, this is what this sentence means. Fine. What they never tell you is, this is exactly how I read the text. Right? The kind of, maybe one way of saying it is, you have not a whole lot, but you do have Indian commentaries, not, a, not on this text, but you have Indian commentaries which basically break apart the grammar of the text for you. To my knowledge, you do not have those in China. The assumption is, well, you can read Chinese, fine. And what this means is this means this, whatever. When you make a translation, you must interpret the grammar. You, you don't have a choice. Well, sometimes you look at translations and you think, well, they didn't do it, but okay. <laughs> but ideally, you interpret the grammar. And therefore, this is fascinating because it's very obvious from the choice of vocabulary, for example, from the way that technical terms are rendered, it's very obvious that the Tibetan translators could read Chinese very well. And they, they had a good technical knowledge of 
Buddhist vocabulary, and so forth. And therefore, when you look at something like this, so my translation on the left, underneath from the Chinese, and I've put into red the important uh, points I want to highlight. So again, Shariputra, beings born in that land of utmost bliss are all avaivartika. We can argue about this, but at least when I made this translation, my argument was, if the Chinese writes it out phonetically, I'm going to write it out phonetically, fine. Maybe that's not helpful, but anyway, what it means is that um, you do not turn back in your progress toward uh, liberation, toward ultimate liberation. Fine. What does the Tibetan say? Shariputra, beings born in that world realm of utmost bliss are all only irreversible. They have taken this extremely strongly. This is potentially, and this question, for example, has been discussed, at least I'm not very familiar with the Chinese uh, interpretive tradition, but in Japan this becomes quite important. I think I have one other example of this for you. Um, and uh, um, the point here, so you can read yourself, I think, the translation. What I want to point you to, and I hope it's not too small, is the note. So I explained to you earlier that we have manuscripts from Dunhuang which transcribe the Chinese text. And not in the transmitted Chinese text, but in the evidence from the transcribed text from Dunhuang, we find that there is a negation, an additional negation in this sentence. I am not a, a theologian of Pure Land thought, so I can't say, but it's certainly far from uninteresting that we find this kind of evidence um, at the, as well. Oh, I did have some other examples. Yeah, okay. Um, this is, of course, an extremely famous passage and much discussed. It's not possible with a few good roots or merit as a cause to gain the opportunity for birth in that land. It's much discussed by the commentators. And what does the Tibetan interpret this as with the term tsam? As for birth in that Buddha land, one will not be born by means of only a little merit or a small root of virtue. It's super interesting. It doesn't say to us what the correct understanding, which is not a concept which makes any sense anyway, but um, it's, uh, it's very interesting to see that at this time, in this place, this was one interpretation of this sentence. Um, okay, maybe the point of this was to say um, uh, the translation doesn't necessarily always present itself super literally if it's not necessary. So the xiang here is, saying, is pointing out that we are talking about the tongue, in this case the, the long and broad tongue, as one of the marks. How did I translate it? Characteristic mark. The Tibetan skips that, evidently because they thought it wasn't necessary to say that. Of course, I don't know what they thought, but anyway, they don't translate it. Um, What did I? Oh, this is also a restriction. Um, it makes the point, um, what I have in my translation, merely hears the name of the sutra. This is also a very much discussed uh, passage, in, particularly in Japanese exegesis. What, what is required for um, obtaining rebirth in the Pure Land? Okay, so what are the takeaways? Um, in the first case, it's extremely interesting, I think, and potentially very valuable from a number of perspectives that in this um, minimally bicultural, I, there's, of course, evidence that it was even more multicultural, um, broadly speaking. Um, as you know, in the, in the cave, manuscripts preserved in the caves, we have manuscripts in uh, many Central Asian languages, etc. cetera. But um, minimally bicultural sphere of Dunhuang you have um, quite a few texts which are translated from Chinese into Tibetan. Moreover, you have texts which are composed probably, almost certainly I would say, in Tibetan, but in this, let's say, bicultural sphere. So 
the language is, let's say, less important than the overarching cultural environment. Um, I think it's quite evident and not at all surprising that we have evidence for populations who were not literate in Chinese, the bar to which is rather high, but were literate in, in um, written Tibetan. Let's say at least they could read the letters. And um, yeah, uh, Tibetan is a language in which if you know the language in your ear and you can read it, well, Bob's your uncle, there you are, right? Um, Chinese not, is not the case. Um, now, uh, it needs to be emphasized that we have further evidence for all kinds of religiosity in Dunhuang as everywhere else in the Buddhist world. And um, a focus on Pure Land, I think, can be misleading and certainly is highly teleological. So why the focus on Pure Land? I think it's obvious because of Japanese fascination with Pure Land. If it were not for that, then we wouldn't be focusing on this. And part of the argument for that is there is no Japanese tradition of, um, let's say, Manjushri Buddhism. So we don't recognize Manjushri Buddhism. But if you started looking for Manjushri Buddhism, well, there's plenty of evidence, plenty. But we don't uh, have, uh, you know, Manjushri Studies Association and uh, whatever. Although if somebody wants to fund it. <laughs> um, so some of these texts were adopted into what I called here, for lack of a better term, a sort of broader um, Tibetan context. Um, this is something which really has not been studied yet. Um, the extent to which we can trace, if it's meaningful to do so, trace evidence of these Sinitic traditions um, informing the, the greater um, uh, Tibetan Buddhist formation, let's say. Um, I published earlier this year a paper in which I showed that one of the poems which I studied, um, which as far as I know, was heretofore known only, um, preserved only in Dunhuang manuscripts in Tibetan, was reworked and um, adopted in the Mani Kabum. And the Mani Kabum is extremely important early terma, so treasure text, um, which is not single handedly, but let's say very influential in the development of the ideology of Avalokiteshvara as the sort of patron saint of Tibet, if you can call it that. And I think it's absolutely fascinating that we can, dem I think, demonstrate, insofar as in our field we can demonstrate anything, we can demonstrate that a key part of the narrative, of narrative grounding of this text, comes directly out of this um, uh, Dunhuang environment, um, Amitabha-centered um, tradition. However, I would say that um, that doesn't mean we can talk about Pure Land Buddhism in Tibet in any kind of meaningful way. Insofar as we can talk about Pure Land Buddhism in Tibet as a meaningful um, tradition, we can do so, and this is what I've said here, only insofar as it basically copies what we can, again, probably retrospectively and somewhat teleologically see as Chinese Pure Land Buddhism. And I say that in that overly complicated way because um, when you look at the Chinese contexts in which you have Amitabha worship and so forth, they take on an exclusivity, I think, only in light of medieval Japanese developments. In a Chinese context, they're part of a much broader, much more um, yeah, open kind of world without much exclusivity. Um, and I think the same thing is true in Tibet. So there's, I'm sure, tons more to say, but another time. Thank you very much. <laughs>